So if we really could have an interface with a computer, with, a, with an artificial intelligence that could read our minds, you can imagine a case in which we could be immortal. But that would completely change humanity and what it means to be human. Merging the human brain with a computer would truly change our species forever. Researchers are developing technology that can transfer data between computers and our brains, and even read people's minds. For now, we have the power to detect brain waves and track electrical pulses within the neurons in our brains, and researchers are using this information, however vague, to aid the differently abled and make life easier for everyone. Among these researchers is 16-year-old Alex Pinkerton. Really, all that we're working on is a brain-computer interface uh, that utilizes graphene, and hopefully, if our math is correct, it'll be sensitive enough to read the magnetic fields of human thought. It was in the 1970s that the Department of Defense first started funding brain-computer interface research. That market is expected to reach a value of $1.72 billion by 2022. Big players like Elon Musk and Facebook have teased their entrance into the market while other companies are showing their work in action. Like Control Labs, who created a wristband that measures electrical pulses from the brain to the neurons in a person's arm, allowing them to control a computer. New and exciting research is pouring out of universities like MIT and the University of California in San Francisco. So what is a brain-computer interface? It's a way in which a computer can take information directly from the brain without you having to type or speak it in uh, and translate that into some kind of action. That's what Pinkerton is working on, a connection between the brain and a device, like your phone or a prosthesis. He was first inspired by his dad, who works on clean energy. My dad came in to talk to our class when I was in third grade about graphene, just to give a little presentation. I'm not sure why, but that sort of sparked my interest. And I had just been thinking of like, why isn't this being used everywhere if it's like the perfect material? And so I started thinking of applications. And at first it was mainly like for the military or something. Now it's sort of focused away from that into, uh, well, the brain computer interface and like VR, maybe super immersive VR, uh, obviously could help the disabled. Pinkerton is the co-founder and CEO of Brain Interface. For the past few years, he has been spending his holiday breaks and the occasional weekend in his dad's lab, working on his graphene brain-computer interface. I was just at my dad's office after school, and uh, we used a program called MathCAD just to type in a bunch of numbers uh, to fit the characteristics of graphene for a brain interface. And at first, uh, it wasn't working. Uh, and so we just kept tweaking and tweaking and tweaking until it finally uh, was able to get to the low, low, low magnetic uh, fields of human thought. Graphene is an almost impossibly thin layer of carbon, only a single atom thick. We've pr finished two prototypes uh, that haven't utilized graphene. It's just mylar, which is basically just saran wrap. The first prototype can reach 10 to the minus 3 Tesla, second prototype 10 to the minus 6, so really nowhere near. Um, but this new graphene, prototype that's about halfway done, if our math is correct, we'll be able to reach 10 to the minus 15, which is the you know, level of human thought that we need to have for a successful brain interface. The goal is to have a computer brain interface that is small enough to fit in an earbud or the inside of a hat that will allow users to use thoughts to control physical devices, like playing music on their phones or to control a prosthesis. People know that it, it could be used for all these uh, amazing things, but they really haven't found the killer application, and I think that's what we've done. His goal is to keep the cost down so the technology can be available to anyone. So right now, uh, a lot of brain interface uh, technology is super cumbersome, inefficient, or expensive. So we're hoping to get all three of those things sort of out of the way. It's basically, it can fit in an earbud, it can read the magnetic fields of human thought with no problem, and it's relatively inexpensive. You can imagine how, how good that could be for disabled people. Uh, they could move robotic arms just by wearing the earbuds and thinking about it instead of having, well, basically their skull opened up and electrodes put on their brain. Elon Musk's version of this technology might be one of those skull-opening options. Neuralink, a company co-founded by Musk, is working to add a digital, quote, third layer above the cortex that would work well and symbiotically with you. The purpose of Neuralink is to 
create a high bandwidth interface to the brain such that we can be symbiotic with AI. The Neuralink website has been little more than a list of job applications for a while, and an update has been teased as, quote, coming soon for months. But this technology would supposedly require invasive surgery. What it seems that they've done is they've taken rats and they've implanted this kind of a uh, grid of electrodes, but they've done it using a technique that they call like a sewing machine, um, which seems to like put these electrodes in really, really quickly, because um, you have to be really specific when you plant these electrodes. But ultimately what it seems to be for is a way of sort of linking brain activity in these rats to some kind of a computer and possibly to each other. And the envelope keeps getting pushed further. A recent breakthrough at the University of California in San Francisco showed how researchers can read the brain's signals to the larynx, jaw, lips, and tongue, and translate them through a computer to synthesize speech. The print that you are seeing is signed in moves. And in 2018, MIT revealed their alter ego device, which measures neuromuscular signals in the jaw to allow humans to converse in natural language with machines simply by articulating words internally. But how can you recognize certain brain waves? How can you filter out the play music command over the constant noise of thoughts and brain waves? So when someone says they have a tool measuring brain waves, the first thing I want to ask is, how do you know they're actually brain waves, as opposed to just some electrical changes that happen from the head and neck? Like, for example, from the cranial nerves, the nerves that innervate the head and neck and help you blink or you know, feel your face. Um, because the signals from deep inside the brain are harder to get at. See, in the examples from the University of California in San Francisco and MIT, both studies focused on computers working out a person's intentions by matching brain signals to physical movements that would usually activate in a person's focal tract or jaw. They're using signals that would usually trigger muscles to simulate what the body would do. The deep internal thoughts and processes within our brain are still quite elusive. Let's say that we're trying to create a device that allows us to play music from our Sonos or, or some, some speaker system in our house, right? So how I would imagine telling the Sonos to do that versus how someone else would might be pretty different. But you could train me to do it. And that is exactly Pinkerton's intent. And you can kind of teach, almost teach the brain to do specific things over and over again. Now, this is not entirely new information. We've been hooking brains up to machines to read electrical activity since the 1920s. And brain-computer interfaces? These are tools that people have been working on since the 1970s. Uh, and, you know, there are still a lot of hurdles in terms of making them commercially available. For a lot of these tools, you actually need to sit very still and you need to keep very still. And so that doesn't have a lot of real-world application. So I think that that's, that limitation is something that um, a lot of these engineers really are facing. Is how do you continue to distinguish signal from noise when the person is moving? Um, that's, that's a major problem. But I feel like in the last 10 years, there's been a lot more interest in terms of commercial companies trying to create a product that allows this to happen. So, you know, the example is virtual reality. I think that is a pretty clear way in which a BCI might be helpful. Brain Interface said it has been approached by several technology and investment companies, but plans to finish its prototype later this year before seeking those opportunities.